Turn in your Bibles as we're beginning to uh, get settled into John chapter 14. We're going to pick up where we left off a few Sundays ago with the Holy Spirit. In John's discussion, chapters 13 through 17, the upper, upper room discourse, this is where Jesus, that very night, he's going to be arrested. And that, very, that next day, he's going to the cross. And as they've instituted the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the new system for the church age, they've gone from the Passover to the church age, he begins a discussion to prepare them for his departure because some really heavy stuff's about to come down in their life. Very, very heavy. So he, he tells them quite a few things, but one of the main things, the things that have interested us tonight is the ministry of the Spirit. He gives us an outline for the ministry of the Spirit that's not found anywhere else. Nobody else deals with the ministry of the Spirit quite like Jesus does in these. He, he gives you the essence. You can use this outline to go everywhere in the Scriptures and plug in. This is the outline. Listen, this is called categorical teaching where he gives you just about every aspect of his ministry during the church age. So let's go to the Lord. Take a moment, confess sin. So this same Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about can be the influence in our life. He can reveal to us and enable us to understand. So take that moment. Confess sin if necessary. Be grateful for what you have. Father, what a great privilege to be part of this body of Christ, this local church, where believers are hungry to grow. And I'm just grateful, Father, to be part of it, to be with believers that don't settle for good enough is good enough. They want to go to the next place. They want to go to the next level not only to learn, but to live so that we can be a great witness, that the Spirit can use us, as Jesus said, as witnesses, to bear witness. So tonight, Father, we, we come to examine that idea again. We pray that you'll open our hearts. Uh, I'm thankful for our free country, our nation, where we're still free to do this without censorship or somebody crashing in the door. Uh, I pray for Ron and Jane in Virginia. I pray you give them safety and give them a good rest. Uh, we love you, Father, and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Now I'm going to show you one, two, three, four, five different places from chapter 14 to 16 that, that he discussed the Spirit. So John 14, 16, and 17 is where we'll start. And we'll just read the passage, and just take some points. We're not going to dig deep. This is just a cursory look, a summary, if you will. Uh, believe it or not, there'll be no old discussion of old man, new man tonight. You believe that, don't you? Yeah, okay. We'll see where it goes. I'm not in charge. John 14, 16, and 7. He says, I will ask the Father... He will give you another helper or comforter, encourager, another mentor, another like me, that he may be with you forever. Now, for those who've been taught that you can lose your salvation, I certainly understand the human logic behind that idea. But when the Holy Spirit's going to be with you forever, I don't think you can lose your salvation. So, and he says, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't, it doesn't behold him. It can't, it can't discern him, can't experience him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and, and indeed will be in you. Now, that was a whole new idea right there. There are several ideas here. So this word another, as we talked about several Sundays ago, there's, there's two words for another. The first one is alas. 
Alas means another of the same kind. Uh, if, you're two, if you have uh, two males and two females, if you say alas about one male says alas about the other male, that's another of the same kind. Two males. But if, the, if he's talking about the females, he'd say heteros, meaning another of a different kind. Okay? That's the, what the Greek words mean. And the word Jesus used here is the word alas, meaning another of the same kind. And that's pretty significant. And as another counselor, or parakletos, the word parakletos literally means the, the verb, para, uh, parakleo, means to come alongside someone and call out to them. You come alongside them, you're driving on the highway, and you come up alongside somebody, and you holler at them and say, your lights are not on. You know, your gas cap's off, or what? you holler at them. That's the idea. It literally means to encourage, to comfort, to advise, to teach, and it's the idea of a mentor. A mentor is someone who teaches you, who gives you insight, understanding about life. And, and we're going to see that Jesus and the disciples, they had a master-disciple relationship in the first century which is very different than what we consider teacher-student in our time. This was a much more intensive, all-encompassing relationship. So, first of all, Jesus and the Twelve are in a master-disciple relationship, and, they, and that relationship, master-disciple, a mathetes, was had a specific paradigm or guideline by which that worked. If you became a, a disciple of Gamaliel, who was one of the great teachers of the law, the other was Hillel. These were two, two schools of interpretation coming from the Pharisee-Sadducee interaction. And these were two theological camps and schools. And if you wanted to be part of one of those schools, you would become a disciple and not only would you become a student, you would literally surrender your life, your time, your day. You, you would leave home, give up everything, and go and sit at the feet of this person and be with them all day, all night, day after day after day. And that's what the disciples did with Jesus for approximately three years. They were together. They, were, they lived together. They slept in the same area. Careful how you say that. Uh, people today, they'll go crazy with it. And listen, as they walked through every aspect of daily life, he, he had a running commentary about how the scriptures applied to that particular circumstance. It was interactive. Lord, teacher, they called him, master, uh, what about such and such? How does this work? And of course, he would do the same. He would, he would ask them, tell me what you think. How does that work? And he would quiz them. He could tell what they thought. Not only was he omniscient and knew everything already, but he had the discernment to be able to look at each one of them. Look, one of the things that happens when you have kids is it doesn't take you too long before you can look at them and know what they're thinking. I mean, you can read their mind, you know, pretty much. And uh, best, these, these were his kids. You know, he could read their mind. He knew what they were thinking. So this, this relationship had a specific paradigm or, or guideline. And, and here it is in B, B, willing submission to the master's authority. If you're going to be a disciple, then you're going to submit yourself to this man's thoughts and ideas and beliefs. That's the purpose, for you to be there under this person so that you can learn to be like them, to believe what they believe, to emulate their behavior, to be like them. You had to be willing to be influenced by the master's views about Scripture, the different interpretations. Listen, Jesus had a, 
an interpretation of the scriptures that nobody had ever heard before. They didn't know, have no idea what he was talking about. Just a few people like Simeon, you know, that was at the temple in Anna. That was at, they, they knew, Simeon especially understood Messiah's mission. Very few did. They had misunderstanding, misinformation. And according to Paul, these guys had a lot they had to take off. There would be a focus on the practical life applications that the master would explain day to day in, in a day to day relationship. Uh, in the construction business, which I, I, I remodeled for years, was in the yard business. I've had, I've had young people that worked with me that I would make my helpers. I mean, they would hold the other end of the board and I would be with them all day long and, and just talk about all the different issues of life, listen to their problems and listen, you know, what are you, what are you going through? What do you, you know, are you, are you dating anybody or you whatever? And listen to them and relate with them and interact with them and have an influence on them. That's the relationship. So the focus on practical life applications explained in day-to-day -day relationship. The master would observe the disciples' beliefs and behavior under pressure so that he could provide guidance for their growth. Man, it's like having somebody with you all the time, somebody in your pocket all the time to help you understand what's going on and what to do about it. How, how should I think about this? The master-disciple relationship was far more than what we think of as teacher-student, the model used in today's church. I mean, we come to church, we hear the teacher, we listen to him, uh, we may know a little about his life, we may be fortunate to be part of a group uh, with strong leadership where you get to see people in action in life, but mostly, mostly it's just study. This was very different. This was not only study, but you, listen, you didn't get up in the morning with the idea, okay, we're going to get five points on the Holy Spirit. You just lived life, and you, you looked to the Scriptures to deal with everything that came up, and you walked through the, your days. They did that for three years. Pretty awesome. Three years with this, with Jesus. Now, the thing they enjoyed was the intimacy with him. And by that, I mean the closeness. Listen, this was not only a teacher-student relationship. They were, they were beloved to him. He loved them. He adored them. Now, they were knuckleheads, and he knew that. But these were his friends. He called them friends. This was an intimacy. And, and he would observe them, and he would confront them over their problems. You know, they would be, <laughs> they'd be arguing over who, which one of them was the greatest. I mean, that's hilarious to me. I mean, which one of us is the greatest? You know, I'm the greatest. And, uh, you know, James and John sent their mom to talk to Jesus to be sit on the right and left. You know, he had to get a big kick out of that. But but he would correct them. He would encourage them. He would comfort them. He had a personal relationship, okay? This wasn't just an academic exercise. This was a personal relationship, a trusting, open, giving, interactive relationship. With us and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit forever, we can have this same, listen, he, when he says another mentor like me what he's saying to us is that this is the relationship that's available to us with the holy spirit the holy spirit wants to be the master and us be the disciple and listen this is not a three-year exercise this is a forever exercise for us to be open and listen and aware of him listen i, I i'm not sure how many of us actually have made contact with the Holy Spirit? How, how many of us actually truly believe that he's there 
that he's speaking to us, that he's communicating with us, for us to relate. He's there like Jesus was to the disciples. And he wants to walk with us in our daily life. Listen, he's inside of us. He reads our thoughts. He knows our thoughts. He knows our thoughts before they happen. He wants to have an intimate, open, trusting, honest relationship with us. I'm trying to grow in that myself. I try, I'm trying to be aware of him all the time. So easily to, to get pulled away and focus back on the worldly things. You know, just normal stuff. But, and look, you just leave him, you, you just shut the door and leave him over there. And he's over there talking away, trying to help you, trying to explain to you, and you're, we're just not even listening. Part of the growth is being able to put that aside, make, put it, make some distance between you and the world, and let the Spirit have this dominant master place in your life where he's the master. He's the master. You're to willingly submit to him and to, and to what he's telling you because he knows what's right. So another counselor like Jesus that's the first idea that he said. And he says, and he's talking to them, like in the chapter 14, verse 1, if you look at that, let not, let not your heart be troubled. And then he gives them this promise about the many dwelling places in heaven or resurrection bodies. He said, I'm going ahead of you to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will uh, come again and receive you to myself. But he's going to tell them, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Now, after three years in having become so totally dependent on Jesus as their conscience, as their guide, as their mentor, as their master, he's leaving. He's leaving. And you're like, whoa, where are you going? I'm going, where, wherever you're going, I'm going too. See, that was Peter. Peter said, I don't care. Wherever you go, I go. And the Lord said, no, Peter, it's not going to work that way. See, Peter was willing to die and go with him. But, he, but you know, Peter, and then Peter got afraid to die. Peter, there's no way Peter could have died that day. The Lord needed him to stay and to do work. Okay? So, okay, let's look at the next verse. Let's look at uh, chapter 14, verse 26. So the Holy Spirit is a mentor like Christ who is inviting us into an intimate master-disciple relationship. In verse 26, uh, in 25, these things I have spoken to you while I remain with you, but the helper or the comforter or the mentor, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So here's the next part of the Spirit's ministry. The Spirit is a teacher. There's a lot of confusion in, quote, Christianity about the Spirit's role in, in what is produced in the believer's life when filled with or influenced by the Spirit. And the predominant misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit is that he causes you to be filled with emotion. Emotional. In fact, it's emotionalism. Emotion for emotion's sake. And the idea is that if you've gone to a spiritual meeting with other spiritual people and the Holy Spirit is involved in that, that everybody's going to get very excited, very emotional. And they call that joy, that emotion is joy. It is not. And that's not the Spirit's ministry. He is a teacher. The Spirit acts directly on our mentality. 
He's a teacher. He's a didasco. He teaches. To instruct, to explain, to, to, uh, uh, to instruct again. Uh, in the sense of the master-disciple relationship, see, we think in terms of privacy. See, the teacher-student says, all right, I'm the teacher, I'm going to teach, and you have privacy to learn. In that relationship, there was no privacy. You follow that? He knew their thoughts. He knew what was going on with them. There was no, there was no privacy. And, excuse me, when he, when he felt it was helpful to them that it would edify, he would confront them. <laughs> he would make fun of them. He would mock them. Ye of little faith. That phrase is not ye of little faith. It's one word. It's little faith. It's like a nickname. It's like somebody calling you shorty. You know, little faith. It's a, it's a, it's a, a joke. It's a mocking term to describe the fact that they, they're, they were short. Their faith was short. So the disciples had been inculcated, not just taught, this had been drilled into them from, from the earliest ages in their life. In Pharisaic interpretation of the law since early childhood. And they had, they had so many wrong ideas that had to be removed. And this is where, listen, Paul, who's the one that explains that idea about taking off and putting on, had more to take off than anybody. Because not only he, did he know everything related to the law, he was, he was relatively perfect in keeping it. He said, I've kept it pretty doggone well. You know, I'm a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So they had been taught all of these things about Messiah and what his mission would be when he got there, what he would look like, where he would come from, and what he would do. None of it had to do with the cross. None of it had to do with dying. And so when he began to explain that to them, I've got to go to Jerusalem and be mistreated by the, the leaders of Israel. And then I'm going to die and be resurrected. They were like, that's crazy. He, that's crazy talk. Why? Because they had bought in like everybody in their whole society had bought into these ideas of the millennial kingdom. That's what they expected. When Messiah came, he would bring in them, he would defeat Rome, make Israel the dominant military force, and the millennial kingdom would, would come in. So now some say that was actually being offered to the Jews, perhaps and they rejected it, and that it was actually being, some believe it was actually being offered all the way up until the, the ascension that had the nation of Israel turn to him any time before the ascension, some believe he would have ushered in the kingdom. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, a, it's that's, then this is why as he's going up, they're saying, is the kingdom coming now? So, this kingdom idea was very difficult for them to get out of their mind and replace. Look, they, they had difficult erasing and replacing that idea. Now, in spite of their willing surrender to the Lord's views, they failed to understand him because of their own old man beliefs. And one of the difficult things to, it's hard to understand Jesus, but I'll tell you one thing about Jesus. He was the most alone person ever was. Nobody, not even his mom, understood what he was there for. He had to, he had to walk against the grain, against everybody else's views and beliefs and expectations, knowing that he was daily going to disappoint them, daily going to violate their expectations of him and, and, and get complaints all the time. And, he, and here he is what he's doing requires more courage and more steadfastness and endurance and surrender to the will of God than anything anybody's ever done in their life. 
and nobody even knew what was going on. He got no praise. He got no glory whatsoever for his life in the incarnation. Nobody understood it. They all thought he was, I mean, his family thought he was a, a wacko. Now, Jesus patiently, repetitiously confronted their false views, offering corrected ideas about his mission. I mean, he finally comes to the point with Peter when he says, get behind me, man. You're, you're talking from the devil. You don't know what you're talking about. So, he used multiple methods to teach. He used parables, stories, live examples, running commentary. He had all kinds of methods. He was an awesome teacher. And he constantly, consistently confronted their false ideas and tried to teach them the truth. This is what the Spirit's doing with us. The Spirit is daily, constantly, even in, listen, even in your dreams. The Holy Spirit is still working, even as our, as our mind processes in our sleep. He's still working to bring about growth. Growth defined as laying aside that which is false, embracing that which is true. The Spirit's ministry is, is to the believer's mentality always and never directly to emotions. Uh, the Spirit's ministry is not emotionalism. So if you find yourself experiencing joy, excitement, it's coming from your mentality. He interacts with, he takes truth and reveals it to our mentality so that we can understand it and believe it and process it. And that will impact emotion. But he never bypasses mentality just to make us emotional. Never. There's no evidence in the scripture, no example, never does he do that. He's a teacher. He says he will teach you and remind you. Hupo menesco, mimnesco means to bring to remembrance, to recall from memory. And, they, and were to recall all that he said to them all the teaching that they received from Jesus. Christ taught, the Spirit enabled. And what did he enable? Them to understand. Listen, you can't understand spiritual phenomena with a limited human mind. See, you got eternal phenomena and you got, you got finite minds. We go down. I got you. Yep. I have about a thousand viewers on there. <laughs> All right. So Christ taught the spirit enabled them to understand so they could believe. And once they believed the, what they'd been taught is transferred into the heart and therefore into memory. This is the system. It's how the human system works. It works the same way with human knowledge. Human knowledge is presented to you. If you understand it and believe it, then it gets processed into your heart and becomes part of the way you look at things and the way you see things. It becomes part of your viewpoint. That's human phenomena. In the spiritual realm, for you to be able to process spiritual phenomena, the spirit has to use his supernatural power to enable that. But he still uses the same human system. You still understand it with your mind under his enabling. You still believe it with your heart. It still is processed into your heart, your belief system, your conscience. And it's still believed into the heart by faith and believed out of the heart by faith. It's the same system. Now, the Holy Spirit operates the spiritual work enabling believers to understand, believe, and program their heart with truth. Initially in life, we program our hearts with that which is not truth. Even if it is truth, like divine establishment principles, 
we process it, we believe it and put it into ourselves as something that serves me. This is pretty important here. See, even when you're immature, an immature believer and you take the scriptures and apply it to your life, you apply it for, the, for your own sake. You apply it from a selfish viewpoint, a standpoint. It's because it's going to serve you. As you grow spiritually, you come to a place where you're, not, you're less concerned with how it serves you and more concerned with how it serves him. And that's the great switch. That's the great motive, growth in motive. That's what ultimately we get rewarded for is motive, not what we do, but why we do it. That's, that's really important. And the Spirit is the only one that can reveal that. So many people call what, what call Christianity a system of do's and don'ts. And it's religion. And we call it legalism. We call it a work system. There's a guy, John Lynch. Uh, you can look him up on YouTube. He's, he's got a program called True Faced. You know, instead of Two Faced, it's True Faced. And he has this story he tells about a believer that comes to a fork in the road. And on this side, there's a sign that says, Pleasing God. And he said, wow, that's a great place to, I'm going to go to this place. And he goes down the path of pleasing God and it opens up into this wonderful room where all the people in it are sharply dressed and everybody looks great. Everybody's manicured and they got the best manners and they speak properly and nobody ever messes up and wow, everything's perfect. But he said, after a while of being in that room, you just get exhausted because you, you have to keep your mask in place. You have to keep everything just right. And what, what he's describing is religion. Religion emphasizes, quote, right behaviors. How do you operate as a Christian? Christian, you operate by doing right things. Not wrong things, right things. So a Christian is a person who does right things who does Christian things. He said, after a while, if you're, if you're lucky and fortunate and you're open to God, he's going to lead you out of that room back down to the path and you're going to look up and the sign is going to say, not pleasing God, but trusting God. And you go down that path and it opens up to a room where everybody in that room looks rough. Nobody's got the mask on. You know, everybody's kind of rough around the edges. And, and everybody's a little bit off. Nothing's ever perfectly right. He said, but everybody in there's real. Everybody's honest. Everybody's, and nobody's faking it. And they've learned that they don't have to create this image. They just be themselves and trust God to be their righteousness. And they learn to give to God because they love him. And that's what gives God joy is that we give to him because we love him. Not that we do all these specific behaviors and avoid these other behaviors. Anybody can do that for any reason. But only as the believer grows in his relationship with God through this relationship with the Spirit can you come to this place where you actually begin to love God more than yourself. And you begin to love others more than yourself. And you're willing to sacrifice your own benefit for the sake of God and others. And that's when you're cooking with gas. That's when everything's working. So Jesus, this is what he was dealing with. And this is what he was trying to teach them. That, that the, they, the Jews had taken the law and turned it into a work system. And people, well, it was a work system. No, it wasn't. It was never intended to be a work system. The Mosaic Law was never intended to be a work system. The do's and the don'ts revealed man's unrighteousness. It was the sacrifices and the promises 
that revealed the work of Christ and what God was willing to do for anybody that trusted him. It was always a faith system. It was never a work to be righteous. That's why Paul said, no flesh will be justified by the law. Nobody gets saved or becomes righteous by doing the law. It just doesn't work that way. This is what Jesus dealt with. And he used all these different methods to teach. And once he got it in their soul, the Spirit would recall it. He teaches and he enables understanding. He allows us to store it in the soul. And when it's time, he recalls it for application. When this comes up and the believer attaches his faith to the truth, you see, I taught a Monday night, I taught a Bible study last night and had, had some had some neat people in it, had some young people in it, in the faith. And we're explaining how a situation comes up and with the believer, there's going to be two different ways of thinking that are going to pop up in, into the believer's mind. One from the old man is going to emphasize me, 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 me. And we were talking about marriage and we were talking about how there's a conflict in the marriage and everybody wants to go, well, what about me? You know, I don't deserve to be treated like this. I, I'm not going to put up with that. I don't have to live this way. I, blah, blah, all me, 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 me. And when you live like that, all it can possibly do is build bitterness. That's all it can do is build bitterness. At the same time, the Holy Spirit is going to recall pertinent principles learned in Bible class for us to apply to this situation. And the situation is if we, if we trust the Spirit and trust the truth and stick with it, we're going to avoid mental sins. When you go with the old man by faith, and what happens? These two ideas pop up, and whichever one you believe in the moment is the one you go with. Now, we've all turned the old man system into habit. So it's our instinctive default. We're just normally habituated to going with it. Something pops up and you go, you're ready to go. You're ready to fight. You're ready to fuss. You're ready to defend yourself. You're ready to do whatever. You know, and the spirit is trying to teach you to lay that aside, to stop living that way, thinking that way, buying into that so that you can hear his voice as he recalls this doctrine out of your soul and shows you, here's God's will. A lady in this meeting last night talked about being criticized by someone in their family, and they didn't want to get specific. And so we kept asking questions, but couldn't get it out of her. And... She said, "Why would, what's that all about? And I said, it's a gift. She's like, what? What do you mean it's a gift? Somebody is challenging her sense of self-worth, criticizing how she uh, dresses, how she does her hair, how she acts, all kinds of criticism. And I said, it's a gift that's going to challenge your image of yourself so that you can throw away your human image of yourself and come to see yourself in Christ. This pressure that's challenging your self-worth is going to help you. It's going to supercharge your need to come to this place where you see yourself in Christ. And it was like when she saw that, she was like, whoa, whoa. See, we think all that stuff's bad. It's bad from a human standpoint, from our human agenda. Well, yeah, it's bad. Somebody criticizing me and putting me down, trying to destroy me, drive me away. But God said, no, I've allowed that because it's going to challenge you to go to who you are in, in Christ and embrace that. She was like, whoa. And that's really what it is. That's really how it works. So. When the Spirit recalls, He enables us to understand and store this and put it in our heart and make it our viewpoint and recall it for application at the right moment. 
And the believer, listen, the believer's role, let me read this again. Here's what the Spirit does. This is really important. The Spirit does all the teaching. Listen, he has preserved the canon of Scripture and made it available to us, to every believer. He teaches from the what the human teacher teaches, the Spirit takes and reveals to the heart of the believer what that means for you. He enables you to understand it. He enables you to store it in your soul. He enables you to make it part of your belief system. He, he recalls it out of your memory when it's needed, enabling you to apply it by faith. He does all those things. What does the believer do? 1 Peter 2.2 2 says the believer has to choose to be hungry. 1 Peter, like newborn babes, desire the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow in regard to your salvation. The word desire is a imperative. It's a command to desire. So you're in charge of keeping your hunger current. The Spirit does all these things. We cause ourselves to be hungry. We put ourselves in a position to get truth, and we believe it when we hear it. We look and listen for the Spirit to recall it, and we believe truth instead of the lie when it's time to apply it. Listen, all we do is believe. Our role in this, the Spirit does all the work, and he presents us with the option. The old man stuff pops up naturally, unnaturally, sin naturally, and the Spirit brings up the mind of Christ for us to choose which one will we believe. And whichever one you believe is going to determine which way you go in the moment and, and overall. Next one. John 15, 26, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. Now, this Spirit of truth, uh, again, he inspired the biblical writers. He teaches the believer's soul with truth. He recalls truth from the soul. He enables application of truth by faith when it's time. He does all the work, and we simply believe the right thing. His ministry is involved in every phase of communication of the truth. Okay? There is no communication of truth without the Holy Spirit. Forget it. The best we can do is divine institutions. That's why many people think the Christian life is the divine institutions. They think if you do the right thing and become a moral person and follow the basic rules of life that that's being a Christian. That if you do all that, God will, will bless you, bless you, bless you all the way. And listen, that's a baby believer living by divine establishment principles. That's all that is. And if, the go if your goal is to be blessed in this life, you say, all I want is to be blessed. That's how you do it. You just live according to divine establishment. You never get involved in anything deep spiritually. You leave all that, or you leave all that alone. But if you're going to follow the Spirit, He's going to lead you into the deep things of God, and you're going to enter into a spiritual war. And the forces of evil are going to try to destroy you, and you're going to have to fight against that. And God's going to lead you into a life of suffering. Suffering for His sake. That's the spiritual life. Divine institutions is the moral life that you live to get blessed. Earthly blessed, material blessings. The spiritual life is a life of growth and growth and growth and suffering through the circumstances of your life to defend your faith in Christ, to stand up for Christ, to glorify Him, to praise Him, to trust Him under all kinds of pressures. And those that are most fortunate in the spiritual life are those who suffer every category of suffering that, that the devil has and comes out on top and comes out on top. Look, I want to go through all of them before I die. 
all of them, and I want to I want to win in every category of suffering the devil can throw at me. Every category he throws at the believer I want to go through, and I want to be come out on top and kick his tail. And when I walk into the throne room, God's going to go, mm, son, you did good. But look, that's a life of suffering. It's a life of suffering. You willing to do that? If you say no, I'm going to tell you, you don't understand. You're listening to the old side. You're listening to the old man. You're listening to the human agenda, not what the Spirit's telling you. The Spirit's going to say, the spiritual side is where all the juice is. It's where all the power is. It's where all the excitement is. It's where all the glory is. So he's going to bear witness. He's involved in every phase of communication of truth. Every aspect of his ministry is based on truth. He leads, he guides, he convicts, he bears fruit, he empowers gifts, he gives us the freedom, and he's going to bear witness. The word martyreo means to testify in court, to, to attest to the truth of something, to give testimony to the truth about Christ. The purpose of the church on the earth is to produce the truth of Christ verbally written and the evidence that what it says is true through our life. The evidence is found in the spiritual fruit in the life of the believer. And all of this comes from the spirit. What are their fruits of the what? Spirit. Okay. Now, John 16, 8. And when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Not going to spend a lot of time on that. The word convict means to, is elenco. It means to convince, persuade, or produce evidence to prove wrongdoing. The convi we call it the convicting ministry of the Spirit. To prove to the world of unbelievers that their guilt, and their, their guilt is real and their need for Christ. That's the Spirit's job. He reveals through the gospel the unbelievers' unrighteousness. This is Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. And this is the Spirit's job, is to make that clear to those that are without Christ so they can understand what the purpose is, what their need is. He uses the gospel to convince the unbeliever they're a sinner and need a savior. He uses the spiritual life and fruit of a mature believer to reveal that Christ is real and that he cares about them. I've come to understand more and more the real ministry is love. Gary Horton called. At 2 o'clock he had 400 kids. At 6 o'clock he had 400 more kids. Hey, 800 kids today. She said, pray. What do you, I said, what do you want me to pray? He said, pray that they'll see God's love. They'll see God's love. Now, <laughs> when you look at when you listen to Horton, you don't normally think of God's love. I don't. You know, I think, Ur, you know. When I met Horton, that's when I knew that a Christian, a, a man Christian didn't have to be a wuss. And I thought, man, you know, you can be a man. And, uh, of course, he was wild and crazy back then. But so he wanted these kids to have an open heart to be able to lay aside their false ideas for the moment to hear what he had to say, that God cared. God, they mattered to him. And I, and, that he, and I said, Father, let him speak with conviction, with absolute certainty. You know, when somebody speaks to you out of love with absolute certainty, that's a powerful combination. That was my prayer for Gary today. Oh, interested to see. John 16, 12, finally. I have many more things to say. This is 12, 13, 14, 15, John 16. I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them right now. They, he said, you're not ready. There's a lot more. This is just the start, but you're not ready for it. You're having trouble taking this in. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak 
on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak. He will disclose to you the things to come. Prophecy. He shall glorify me, for he shall take what is mine and shall disclose it or reveal it to you. All things that the Father has have been given to me. And therefore, that's why I said, he will take of what is mine and reveal it to you. So let's unpack that just a little bit. When he says he will guide you into all truth, the word guide, hodegeo, means to lead the way or uh, to, to guide or show the road. The word hodas is the road. It was the earliest name for Christianity. They called it the way. And the word hodas literally means the way, the road. So it's ago and hodas. It means to lead or, or guide you along the way. The Holy Spirit shows believers the road that truth forms and the road in which we walk. The Spirit reveals the truth to the believer's heart, enlightening the eyes of your heart so that you can see God's plan for you. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, the power that's in you. This is what he does. Listen, that word, he, that I pray that he, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The word enlightened means to give light. The Holy Spirit gives light. He shines light on the truth so that you can see it in your soul. He guides us into all truth. In other words, he gives us the big picture from categorical doctrine and then the detailed view of specific issues in life. I remember I started in a Bible study with Buddy Peake, and Buddy was teaching. He would listen to a tape from Bob Thiem, and then he would go to the Bible study and teach that same concept. And I had been going for, I don't know, six or eight weeks, and every week he would teach a different idea. And we'd cover it pretty good, and then the next week it would be a different idea, and then the next and before you know it, I had about eight or ten pieces, and I'm sitting there, and they're all kind of, I'm sitting there listening, and all of a sudden the Spirit started taking different pieces and putting them together. Inside, I, I could see it. He gave me, he gave light. Light came on, and I could see the pieces, how they fit together. And I went, wow. And before you know it, I had the big picture. I had the hurrah view, the big picture, the horizon. So... That's what he does. That's what he does. And he said, he will, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak. Now, it's interesting. This word speak, the word laleo, is a word specifically, it's a technical term meaning to communicate truth. He speaks laleo communicating truth, what he hears. Now, what Jesus is doing here, he's created an analogy of sorts so that the disciples can relate. What we have here is an image of the Holy Spirit listening to God the Father and God the Son discuss the plan. And what he hears, he gives to us. That's what you're getting there. The point is the Spirit's work is to emphasize the work of Christ that is able to save us and edify us and not emphasize himself. The Spirit doesn't emphasize himself. But he is the agent. He is the closest thing to God in our life. I mean, he is inside of us. He speaks to us constantly. He relates to us. He invites us into this intimate relationship where he wants to be the master and us the disciple. He wants to give light so that we can see all the things that we struggle with and all the things that we want to know. He wants to give light so that we can see it in our soul. And he says, these things he will disclose, this word anagelo, anagelo, anagelo. Uh, you see this A-N and then angelo, that's the word angel means messenger. It means to announce, to uncover what is hidden, to explain. 
The Spirit looks and listens to know what will happen in the future and announces it to the church. His announcements of what is to come are called prophecy. And all prophecy has already been given and written down in the Scripture. Okay? There's no more prophecy. In fact, the gift of prophecy was temporary. It's gone. And the prophecy that the Spirit heard from, from the Father and the Son has been already revealed and written down in the Scriptures. Now it's just about interpreting what that says into what it means. And he is all, he is all about doing that. And it says, Jesus said, uh, he shall glorify me. And the word doxadzo, this, this is so important. Y'all listen to this if you're not asleep. It means to outwardly expose inner qualities. To glorify something means to outwardly expose the, its inner qualities. Jesus described the lily, the glory of the lily is greater than that of Solomon in his finest dress. Solomon's the richest man on earth. He's got all the finest clothes that you could possibly imagine. And Solomon is decked out to the nuns, whatever that means. And he says the lily is, has more glory than Solomon. Lily starts out as a little ugly bulb. You put it in the dirt and it gets uglier because it's, now it's all full of dirt. I mean, it's just dirt. But look, the inner qualities of that bulb, under the right circumstances, it comes up and produces this beautiful flower, and that's its glory. To glorify Jesus is to take his inner qualities of his character and his essence and reveal them outwardly to others so others can see that. Really important. When the Bible talks about God, man's purpose is to glorify God, See, people don't want really to know what that means. They think, all right, our purpose is to go, yay, God, blah, 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 and sing songs, and all that's part of it. But listen, to glorify God means to manifest God's inner perfections, his virtues, outward so that other people can see them. Now, how do we do that? Of course, we tell people about those things, but the ultimate privilege and opportunity for the Christian is to live that out, to become like that and live that. That's how you do it. The Spirit's ministry is to make known the virtues of the character of Jesus and the Godhead. The Father has given everything to Jesus, and the Spirit reveals all of that and allows us to partake of all of that in Christ. He reveals the person and work of Christ in the gospel so that we can be saved and share it with the world. He reveals the character of Christ so that we can make his character the life goal of our own character. And he reveals the plan of God for the believer in time that we might grow in grace and knowledge, form the character of Christ in our, in our own soul, mature in our understanding of the divine perspective and look at life and live life from the, the divine view. That's how God's character is manifested through us. The Spirit's job is to, is to make available this process of learning, erasing, replacing, and, and growing in it so that our character becomes the same as his. And we live that out. And we manifest the character of God himself. John's discussion of the words of Jesus Concerning the Holy Spirit, give us an outline to understand his ministry. He indwells us, making our bodies the temple of the Godhead. He empowers us to understand and enter into the divine plan for the new believer, born again as a spiritual baby to grow up in Christ unto a mature man. Able to embrace the incredible opportunities found in Christ and then to take on the adult responsibilities of a spiritual warrior in the angelic conflict. So, the real goal of the Spirit is to, is to bring us into the kingdom through faith in the gospel, to grow us up into maturity that we might manifest the character of God. That's what Jesus told us. That's what he told them. Later on, Paul is going to amplify all that 
in his in his discussion and add a lot more of the salvation ministries and he's going to get mechanical about how all this works so uh let's pray father we're grateful for these concepts and these teaching and uh, i pray that we see this outline clearly and understand the limits of the spirit i mean he has no limits except he there's things he doesn't do many things that the the church says and i and i and i say the word church carefully says that he does but he doesn't so i pray that we could come to understand the limits of the spirit's ministry and enter into what he does do what his real ministry fully and completely and i pray all this in christ's name amen